Well, I'm actually for the next maybe 20 minutes, I just want to share what I feel. Uh, number one, before I talk about uh, what is my prediction, uh, I want to go back to basics. Uh. Okay, nothing new. Uh, if you actually have gone through my class, of course, what you did, uh, you would actually find this familiar. I always believe stock market performance is what is actually uh, influenced by global economic performance. Uh. So nothing new. Uh. Okay. So what I actually want to stress here is this, uh, how do we actually tell the global economy is performing well? Okay, what is the measure we actually use to measure global economy performance? What is the GDP? Uh, thank you so much. Okay, and to be precise, we look at GDP growth, potential GDP growth. <clears throat> okay, of course, if you think that GDP is going to very well, okay, then of course, Economy is going to perform well, economy is going to perform well, stock market perform well. So this is a relationship that uh, I've established up here. I think everyone is agreeable to this. Okay, uh, when we actually measure GDP or try to visualize or try to estimate hey, whether it's really growing, uh, I, I want to put some visual in your head. Uh. You can actually visualize GDP as the sum of total income of every individual. So one way to measure GDP, of course this is not a complete way, but I think this is good enough. One way to measure GDP is all our income, salary, wages, add together is actually equal to a nation's GDP. A very good way to compute GDP. <coughs> okay, but we actually compute the main component maybe. Really. Huh? So let's say for example, we add up all Singaporeans, wages, and wages add together. Okay, that would be Singapore GDP. If we add up every single citizen together, that's the world GDP. Okay, so from here, uh, probably it can help you better visualize that how you see whether your income is growing or not. Okay, so this one, anybody disagree or any comments? So one, one part I want to establish is this GDP is equal to everyone's income add together. Okay, yeah? Okay, so what is income influenced by? Uh? Okay, your income or income? Actually, from an economic perspective, what is it influenced by? Actually, it's just influenced by two main things. Uh. One is what we call the money supply. Okay, money supply, how much money is there in the economy for you to earn? The other one is actually called the money velocity. How fast people spend money. Let me give you an analogy easier to see. Uh. So assuming now uh, we actually have an economy only 2%. So assuming our uh, economy only 2%, there's actually one economy 2%. Uh. Each one has, uh, this economy that's special, it's the, the, the whole economy is about $2. So each one has $1. And they spend on each other every day. Uh. So you can imagine this, one of them is a chicken farmer, one of them is a duck farmer. Then the chicken farmer wants to buy a duck every day, so I have to pay $1 to the duck farmer. Then the duck farmer wants to buy a chicken every day, so I have to pay $1 to the chicken farmer. Okay? So my point here is this. Uh, economy money supply means $2, $1 each. If they spend on each other every day, what is the income per person? $30, huh? Okay? My point here is this. Let's say money supply means $2, $1 each. If they spend each other every day, income per person is actually $30. Huh? So this is what I mean by income is a function of money supply and money velocity. So if let's say, for example, they spend every hour. Possible, right? Because let's say, I want to spend on you and you really spend on me. I want to spend on you and you really spend on me. Okay, so it's actually possible, right? I actually got the money in. After I got $1, I could just spend it to you. After you got it, you really spend it to me. Okay. So in that sense, what is the income? If they spend every hour, so it's about 30 multiplied by 24. So basically, even with a $2 money supply, okay, they can generate income per person about $600 plus. If let's say somehow our money supply increased to $200, instead of each one of us have 100, now we actually have 200. And uh, this 200, I have nothing to buy except for chicken. And your 200, I have to buy except for duck. So uh, basically, what happens here is we end up increasing our price. Okay, it's still the same chicken, still the same duck. Okay, but now I said $200. So we go back to the, I spend each other on every day one. So with $200, I 
I spend two hundred dollars on you every day, you spend two hundred dollars on me every day, what's our income per month? You come check. Six thousand. Money supply and money velocity is the one that determines what is the income per person. Okay, of course, if income continues to increase, that means your GDP is growing. GDP is growing means what? The economy performs well, it doesn't perform well, so the market will perform well. With that, what I'm trying to measure is, so what is the money supply going to be going to be in the future? What is the money velocity going to be in the future? So from there, ah, then I can make a sort of like an intelligent guess to see whether is the GDP likely to go up in the future? Is the economy going to get better in the future? So this is my line of thoughts. Okay, so this is what I Again, like I said, when I actually look at the global economy, I look at only three main economies, the US, Europe, China. Anybody can remember why? Why are we looking at US, Europe, and China? When you look at global economies, thank you so much that the largest are together, their GDP is 60%. So I imagine this tree. Okay, so this is the money supply for US. So the US, the maximum, they actually work to M2. Okay, so this is the money supply. So as you can see, uh, US has been printing money. Uh, so again, what I'm trying to say is this if let's say money supply keeps going up, then people income will go up, people income will go up, GDP will get increased. And it has been shown here that the US money supply has been increasing over the past for a number of years. In fact, ever since um, the Lehman Brothers crisis, they have been increasing quite drastically. And so what this chart is showing. <coughs> but here's the thing, I will talk about this later, uh, but uh, this is one thing I'm still trying to understand, why is it? Uh, but uh, I'll be paying attention to this. Uh, okay. uh, there's this thing about unwinding the Fed. Uh, unwinding is gigantic balance sheet. Okay, maybe that, later someone will know more about this, so you can share. Uh, so just a brief explanation of what this is about. Okay, when actually Fed want to print money, it's not so straightforward. Like, it's not really like press one button, print money. Uh. Okay, there's actually a process of you know for them to generate uh, you know somehow playing some financial engineering uh, to create money to then buy bonds. Uh, so I'm trying to say here is this uh, fact the money supply has been increasing, uh, but going forward uh, the the money supply may not continue as much and in fact it may go the other way. Okay, uh, euro. So don't need to say yeah. Uh, so they have also been printing money, eh? Okay, money supply has also been increasing. So in fact, the euro has been going up quite, uh, as you can see, can go up quite sharply. Uh, China, again, also what you say, money supply also increased. Huh? Everyone is printing money. Huh? So B, you can argue, uh, that means uh, there's no real productivity. It's just inflation. Okay? But as a stock perspective, uh, even if inflation, uh, the stock price will go up. Uh. Okay, maybe I explain this part. Uh. Okay, I explain this part. Uh. What is productivity? What is inflation? Uh. So let's say, for example, I'm a chocolate data seller. Okay, I'm a chocolate data seller. Now I sell chocolate data one plate, five dollars. Every day I sell one plate, for example. I make five dollars. Two ways for me to increase my income. Uh. One way is this. Now instead of one plate, I sell two plate. Okay, so I make ten dollars. This is called increase in productivity. This is what real GDP growth are the way of it. Okay, then my income will increase. Okay, what is the other way for me to increase my income? I just raise the price of my company. I still sell one plate, but now instead of selling five dollars, I sell ten dollars. Okay, this is what we call inflation. Okay. From an economic perspective, okay, they like real GDP growth, like for example, especially from a politician perspective, uh, they want the economy to grow in the real GDP form, people produce more. Okay, but from a stock perspective, uh, my point here is this, don't care whether I uh, easily increase price or don't care whether I produce more, does the stock price go up? Does the fact remain that my income increase? And if my earning increase, does the fact mean that the, the stock price will go up? Okay, so I don't care whether it's inflation or is it really productivity. Yeah. In fact, when money supply go up, okay, to me, I think it's actually good for the stock market in that sense. That's the point I'm trying to pull across. Okay, China going up. Okay, Singapore, money supply is going up. Huh? 
<coughs> so US has been quite uh, quite bullish for a while. Okay, but now and then we start seeing, you know, things like this. And, but uh, this is not conclusive. Huh? Probably just one month, but we probably have to watch a bit. Uh, Eurozone, you can see here, is actually still uh, very confident. Okay, the people are getting more confident, the people are more willing to spend. Okay, they are not worried that I cannot make money. Okay? China, uh, I, I just spent two weeks in China, so I think I have to share my personal observation. Uh, of course, I'm very pro, pro China one. <laughs> okay, so this is my personal observation. Uh, it's actually that society is very conducive to spend all their income. Number one, you can see there's a lot of growth opportunities. They are definitely not worried about jobs. Uh. And with this one belt, one road, uh, which I'm going to talk about very soon, uh, I think that one is going to be tremendous. The people are confident. The people are confident that I, uh, today I spend all my money, never mind like what I can make again. It's actually going. Number two, uh, uh, I actually realized this. Uh, uh, those in the 20s to 40s are basically they don't have to worry about retirement. They are actually at a. Uh, this group of people is the product of what I call the one child policy. Uh. So most of them don't have seedings. Uh. <coughs> like, for example, my wife's friend, most of them have actually one child policy. So what does it mean? Uh? So as long as they have one house, okay? Yeah, parents' house they actually going to inherit. Correct, right? right. <laughs> they are going to inherit. And if let's say, you know, other than one, in fact, they are going to inherit two houses. And you know how much housing price has went up. So basically, they are retirement center already. So even though their salary uh, is a lot lower than, you know, Singaporeans or whatever, uh, but, you know, just by the house, they are set for their retirement expenses. They can rent out everything. So in that sense, so like Singaporeans, we have to think about retirement, so on and so forth, better say that we don't have to. Have to have. My father got one house, eh? uh, you know, the father side got one house, uh, the mother side got one house, and got so many houses. So many they got problems, so many houses, much money you want to. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is happening. Uh, quite interesting, quite interesting. I remember I actually, when I was in Chongqing, going to teach uh, a teacher that is about to retire, a senior teacher, only make about 6,000 learning P. Uh. So for those who don't know, one thing is to find learning P. Uh. So 6,000 learning P is only 1,002. Uh. But then, uh, throughout her teaching career, she was being offered to buy houses at 30% of the market price. Uh. Okay, when the market was at like 5,000 learning P per square feet, uh, they can actually buy at 1,000 learning per square feet. And the best part, the school helped them to rent out to students. So she said, yeah, like, only six of them, but uh, after teaching for trades, I got three houses. Uh. <laughs> and now after that, they got property boom. Uh, they spend one thousand on their house, it's easily ten, twelve thousand. <laughs> so for them, uh, they really don't have to worry about okay, the future needs and the house is actually there. Basically, the, the spending culture is really there. Uh. You have no choice, uh, the peer pressure is there. So let me just show you something, uh, okay? Uh, if you actually look carefully, this is Maggie Mia. Uh. Instant order. Uh. Instant noodle, one egg, one hot dog is 22 rolling pin. Four dollars. Eh? Then no choice. Eh? I'm talking of just about instant noodle, egg, and if you actually want to have a, a, a better, more atas, so like, for example, me and my wife, when we go to the mall, three of us, me, my wife, and kid, easily we spend 200 rolling pin per new one. And just like eat the fur and so so on. Okay? And if you ask them, the income for office executive is only about 5,000, 6,000. So to them, uh, it's, like, it's a bit like culture. Like, for example, a lot of people laugh and ask, why are Singaporeans so crazy? It comes so expensive to buy. So for them, in China, no choice. Okay, you think about it, uh, some of us actually earn about 5,000 sing. Okay? What's the context? Some of us actually earn about 5,000 sing. Can you imagine your lunch time, you have to eat $22 every day? Oh, it's like, like for us, it's eating restaurant every day, right? <clears throat> okay, so my point is this, uh, uh, China one is, uh, they have the ability to increase their money velocity. Uh, they don't have to worry, whatever they earn, they can spend, and culturally, they're actually going to do so. So in short, I think the money velocity is actually quite high in China, that's my main point. Even all, all these conditions in place. 
Okay, uh, and a lot of assumptions are made. So a lot of people actually come and say, oh, okay, uh, uh, the, the property, there's a property bubble, this bubble can actually boost, uh, can actually burst their confidence. Huh? Uh, I actually take a closer look, but I realize uh, there isn't a property bubble. Put it this way, the shop price increase uh, is actually only in a few cities. Uh. Uh, quite about Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, these four cities uh, for the shop price. Shop price increase uh, in these four cities. So China is not just these four cities, uh, a lot actually still okay. okay? Uh, and in real estate, uh, there's actually one very crude way for us to calculate what is a fair price, uh, which is just basically 100 times the money house income. Okay, like for example, in Singapore, uh, the minister can come and tell you our house is affordable. Why? Because our money household income is about 7,000. Household income is 1,000. Okay? Using this formula, that means a fair price is about 700,000 sing for an apartment. And then now they can tell you, hey, if you don't mind you know, staying a bit outside, you can actually buy it for 300, 400,000, so our house is still quite affordable. Uh, so there's actually this form of measurement. Okay, so you think about it, yes, the prices in China, the housing prices in China is went up, but they're actually still quite affordable. Uh, uh, for those who actually uh, stay in better condos, uh, okay, their, house, their household income is actually about 10,000, 12,000, and they are buying something about 1, 1 million, 1, 2 million. So it's actually not expensive. Okay, it's just that it was very cheap a few years ago. So when the price went run up, people were like, ah, what happened? Okay, uh, I actually talked about the money. Uh, I usually talk, talk about employment. Employment, I think, is, I think is good. Confidence, uh, besides US. Okay, again, it is good. So third is innovation. Uh. Uh, again, uh, for my China experience, very interesting. Uh, really, my, at least for myself, uh, my understanding of e-commerce is really, really very little. Only when I was in China, then really understand why it's e-commerce. Uh. Okay, this was what happened. I actually wanted to... Uh, send a uh, fragile item back to Singapore, from China sent to Singapore. So I actually need a bubble bag. Okay, you know, bubble wrap, uh, whatever you call it. So what e-commerce does is this, we, uh, what my wife did was, they just go to the uh, phone, okay, look for bubble wrap, click, once the next part, next day they did read it. And this is not the best part here, the best part here is that uh, if you don't like it, you can send back. You just have to pay for the delivery fees, it's actually very minimal. So this is what my wife did, you don't just go there for one push-up week, and it's been buying. Then every day, a puzzle come in, a trousers shirt, where he don't like, and just send back. So that is e-commerce, so it's very interesting. I mean, I think China, I think it's very interesting, but it's almost like, I still remember we were still chatting, and maybe one day, can we just order Thailand coconut? I don't know if you can call. And next day come to you. I think it's going to happen. Okay? So of course with this e-commerce, uh, e uh, uh, with innovation, uh, that is you've got things going to buy. So basically now you can almost buy whatever you can think of. You go to the e-commerce website. Anything else is so that all you have to do is just think. Yeah, maybe I'll give this. You go and search chef, you click uh, tomorrow car, go like, and send back. And I think that's e-commerce. I think that is going to stimulate a lot of money velocity. Yeah. Okay, and of course with things like cashless payment, so and so forth, of course this will also inside our velocity. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so before I, I give my overall summary, I just want to share some, uh, two other observations. One here is this, uh, one belt, one road. Uh, again, if you have not read about it, please start doing so. I think this is going to be very huge. Huh? So the latest quote by EPM, uh, how big is this thing? Uh, okay, it actually connects Asia, Europe, Africa. Through a network of road, ports, bridge, tunnel, pipeline, and other projects involving almost 70 nations and two thirds of the world's population. Okay, that's going to be the impact of one by one route. And of course, it's a great child of uh, uh, President Xi Jinping, so you have to really give it to him. So you can see tons of opportunities there. That means, you know, next time you know, we can actually sell to people like from Kazakhstan, you know, whatever. Uh, you can sell to people like Israel, so on and so forth. Can you imagine how much more trade, much more business, that's going to happen. Okay, so I think this growth initiative is going to spur easily uh, our region. I don't know so much about Singapore, but our region 
least for the next 30 years. So of course, uh, having talked about economy, I have to talk about risk. Uh. Okay, number one, uh, uh, when we talk about risk, we have to speak to two segments. Uh. One is, you have to see, is there any real impact on money supply and velocity? Uh? It really impact the money supply, really impact the money velocity. Uh. That's the real thing that you should do after. The rest is noise, uh, don't go and care about so much. Like for example, I actually do uh, pick up a few risks that will impact this. Uh, the Fed unwind balance sheet, like I said, I need to find a bit more. Okay, it's still something I, I'm still trying to figure out, uh, but this is actually in the news. If you're interested, you can go to Google. Okay, you can go to Google this term, uh, Fed unwind balance sheet. Then you also see US uh, consumer confidence drop, uh, as for what I shared just now. Uh, then, uh, uh, Trump is always talking about trade protectionism and Brexit. Uh. So these are the main ways I actually spotted around. But uh, my personal take is that the impact will not be felt so soon. Uh. I think 2 page 2017 probably we will really feel the impact. And probably we can really feel the impact only 2018. So this is my personal take. Uh. And of course we have a lot of noise. Uh, North Korea threat always talk about uh, now the latest is uh, they have this anti missile. What if North Korea should run to the US? So to me, all these are noise. Uh. So again, if let's say the market drop because of these two issues, uh, you see me rushing and going by. <laughs> Any questions so far? Uh, uh, I think there are one factor in there. So in fact, now they actually, if they increase the interest rate, it's actually good news. Finally, you talk about increased interest for the past few years. <laughs> so I think it's factored in. Uh, why I say it's good news is because uh, if one, once they increase, uh, that means uh, it's an official endorsement that the US economy is actually doing very well. Okay, you will send this message if they increase right now. So to me, it's a good news. Okay, you thought, I just want to give you an overview. What I'm trying to say is this, uh, going forward, at least for the second half of 2017, money supply velocity is still likely to continue to increase. And in short, I'm bullish. This is my prediction. Uh, just a prediction. Uh, opinion and anything. You know my disclaimer. Uh, take money, be happy, lose money, lose money. Uh, <laughs>